it is steamy in Cleveland. Hot enough for you? We are coming on the air as at least one in five Americans is now facing some kind of extreme weather threat. We got severe storms, hail, flooding, record-breaking heat. We'll get into what the brutal weather means, wherever you're feeling it, for the July 4th celebrations and for the trip home over the holiday. Tensions are also rising in the Middle East after at least eight people were killed in an Israeli drone attack. The latest reaction coming into us just before we came on the air. And then the hunt for suspects on a holiday weekend shooting in Baltimore that left two people dead, more than two dozen wounded. What police are telling the public today about that incident. And thousands of hotel workers are starting up the picket lines right now after going on strike. Their demands and what the walkout means for the industry and for your next vacation in Southern Cal. In the backstory, how heartbreak is costing some people just about everything. My victims of online romance scams are now speaking out about what they went through and the warning signs you should look out for, for you and also maybe a loved one. That's later in the show. Hey there, I'm Tom Costello in for Halley, and we start tonight with 36 million people facing the threat of severe storms up and down the East Coast, and then especially in the Midwest and the midsection of the country. Take Chicago. The rains there have gotten so bad, the city is recovering from some huge flooding tonight. You see it right there. Cars submerged after days of downpours. Other parts of the country are also getting slammed. Take a look at what a storm did in Lexington, Kentucky. Power lines pulled down. Giant trees ripped from their roots from the sheer force of that storm. Tens of thousands are still without power in Lexington. If it's not pouring, hailing, or gusting where you are, chances are the temperatures outside could be brutal with another 33 million under heat alerts right now. Now, none of this is helpful if you're one of the millions traveling around the country for the July 4th holiday. Flight delays are expected to creep up over the next 48 hours as airports in some of the country's biggest cities. Let's bring in right now the folks who are covering this for us. NBC's Amelia Aketa is in Long Island City, New York. Dana Griffin is in Santa Monica, California. Emily, we're starting with you and the severe weather that we're seeing across the board. What are we hearing and what are you seeing right there that are places that are getting hit awfully hard? Hey there, Tom. Well, the story right now is the heat and the humidity. You can see the sunny skies behind me, but that won't stay the case for long as we expect to see severe weather, a major system move into the East Coast, impacting a large portion of the I-95 corridor that you mentioned. Could impact tens of millions of people stretching from the Carolinas up here to New York City. And with it, it could bring hail the size of ping pong balls later this evening in the next couple of hours, torrential rain, winds gusting above 65 miles an hour. And for some people, it will be, it will feel a Bit like a one-two punch because so many communities felt severe weather over the weekend, largely in the country's midsection. You talked about those severe winds slamming into Kentucky. In Missouri, the storm took a deadly turn over the weekend, killing a 33-year-old woman and a five-year-old boy. In Chicago, the story was the flooding, the torrential rain, up to nine inches of rain in parts of the Chicago area. The mayor there said they haven't seen that level of rain since 1987. Take a listen here. You know, you have in one region of the world where they're ex expecting 110 degrees, another region where there's fire. You have our region, uh, Midwest and East, that had unprecedented levels of rain come through. Um, you know, it's obviously disconcerting. The other thing New Yorkers are contending with here is the air quality. There is an air quality alert for the New York City area, and not because what we've been reporting on for the last couple of weeks, that smoke coming in from Canada. Instead, it's because of ozone, pollution mixed with the heat. Fortunately, the governor says a condition should improve by tomorrow night's fireworks display, Tom. Emily, thank you. She's got the U.N. building behind her there. Emily, thank you very much. All right, now we want to get quickly into checking with Dana Griffin, who's uh, on the West Coast, Santa Monica, California. Uh, Dana, talk to us about what kind of extreme heat you're seeing there. We've had it across the country, uh, and now it's happening in portions uh, that you are uh, watching very closely. 
Well, I can say, Tom, we've experienced a weakened heat wave here up and down the West Coast. In some areas from Washington to Phoenix, they've had heat as high as 120 degrees. No, I skipped That's why you've question, got thousands of people I'm... escaping that here to Santa Monica Pier, where you can see so many people are bringing their kids, trying to cool down. We actually talked to a group of people that were playing football. They came from the Bay Area where they said that they were experiencing 90 degree temperatures. But here it's about the temperatures are in the 60s, so a much needed reprieve. But for one woman who came from Detroit, she was in for a little surprise. Listen. I kind of like it because it's escaping the heat. We're from Michigan, so it's very hot there right now. It's nice to get the breeze, and it's, it's good. So, and you're having a lot of people come here to, again, Tom, try to escape the brutal heat that is maybe sticking around in some areas. All right, and you've also got another story that you're watching there, right? It might yet be another impact on, on people and the environment. It's a toxic algae bloom that's poisoning the ocean. Like, I understand sea lions are affected. Yeah, this is a product of the runoff that we as humans produce. The, that toxic algae, the smaller sea mammals are feeding onto that, and then you've got dolphins and sea lions that are eating the fish. They're washing ashore, Tom. Some of them have died. Others are getting super sick. And just about four miles south of here in Marina del Rey, some residents there are actually asking for the city to cancel their 4th of July fireworks tomorrow because there is actually a nesting or a resting pin for some of those sick sea lions where they're being rehabilitated. They're just yards away from a barge where those fireworks are supposed to be shot from and they're concerned for the health of these six sea lions. Take a listen. Pretty devastating having things like seizures, not being able to like swim very well, um, and even resulting in like death. People are you know taking selfies with them and you know all these you know, this is not a it's not a photo op for Instagram. It's like a real um, situation with this algae bloom. And how serious this is in some areas in Santa Barbara County, they're asking people not to eat shellfish because of that. But here it's also dangerous for people. Officials here along the coast are warning people to not get close to these these sea lions. And a lot of people mm. are coming. They're visiting from out of town. Even before we have this toxic algae bloom, they it, it's not a smart idea to take selfies or try to touch right. or get close to these sea lions. Or if you're coming to the coast, you're not from this area. This is not the time to try to get close to those animals because they are very sick and very aggressive. And it could just be bad news for everyone. Tom. Oh, boy. All right, Dana, thank you very much. Good advice there. Let's bring in now our meteorologist, Michelle Grossman. Uh, Michelle, give us the big picture. Is this just a coast-to-coast a -coast thing, or is there any hint of reprieve or an oasis anywhere in the country? Hi there, Tom. Well, we've been talking about this for weeks and weeks, talking about the storms and also the steamy weather. We do have some reprieves, but most of us will see the chance for at least some scattered showers, if not some stronger storms as we go throughout today and also tomorrow. Let's look at the picture right now because this sort of tells the story. You sort of see those storms blossom up on that last frame. That's that daytime heating kind of igniting those storms. And we're going to see this today and then once again on your holiday tomorrow. Notice these darker colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows. That's where we're seeing the heaviest downpours. We're looking at really stormy conditions. Lots of lightning starting to pop up here in parts of the New England area, northeast, mid-Atlantic, down to the southeast, even down to the Gulf Coast states. This is a trailing cold front. So we have that warmth. We have that humidity. We have the trigger of the cold front. And that's what's igniting these storms. We're going to continue to watch this tonight. We even have severe thunderstorm watches. That is in the yellow. That corresponds to the watch boxes. That is through some of them through 10 o'clock this evening. And then we have these little orange boxes. Those are severe thunderstorm warnings. That means those storms are happening right now. We're going to continue to see these blossom and pop up in and out as we go throughout the next couple of hours. So millions and millions of Americans under a severe weather risk, 34 million at risk for winds gusting over 60 miles per hour. We could even see winds gusting over 80 miles per hour or 280 miles per hour in portions of the northern plains. Looking at the chance for some hail that could cause some damage to a low tornado threat, but notice it's not zero. So we're going to still watch the chance for a tornado or two. We had a few in the northeast last night. 
So DC, Richmond, uh, down to Charlotte, where you see the yellow and the orange, that's a likely spot for seeing some of these storms. Same story tomorrow. This is July 4th. So we're looking at the real estate kind of growing in terms of who may see a storm or two. 14 million at risk, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. That could bring down some trees, bring down some power lines, take out the power in some spots. Also hail, a few tornadoes are possible. So we're talking Minneapolis, the Sioux Falls, North Platte, Denver, even to Salina. That will be the story as we go th through tomorrow. Now that's the stormy side. We've been talking about that for weeks. We've been talking about the heat as well. We had a heat dome that was kind of tacked in place, bringing in that heat. But look at this coast to coast heat. The Southwest, we're looking at temperatures near 119, 120 in some spots. That's 36 million people impacted. The Pacific Northwest, a heat advisory. We're going to begin to heat up there too. And we're looking at the Carolinas in the Southeast too for the chance of some really warm weather. You factor in the humidity there, kind of pulling off the Gulf and on the Atlantic. We're going to feel warmer than it actually is. So temperatures as we go throughout the rest of today, topping out at 119 in Palm Springs. That's 11 degrees degrees above what is typical for this time of year. Boise, 92. Portland, 80 degrees. 105 in Redding. It's not just today, though. So tomorrow, you're out and about. We have the parades. We have the celebrations, the fireworks. Well, you want to take some time indoors or at least get to shade, some air conditioning, drink lots of water if you can. Palm Springs tomorrow, 119, 114 on Wednesday, 109 on Thursday. So no breaks there. Into the triple digits in Fresno. Reno, we're looking at temperatures in the 90s. Salt Lake City, we're looking at temperatures in the 90s as well. 99 on Tuesday. Tom? 119 I know. in Palm Springs. No thanks. I'm staying right here. Uh, <laughs> Michelle, thanks very much. Michelle Grossman. Sure. All right, now to the latest surge in gun violence. Two mass shootings just this weekend. First to Baltimore, where police are searching for multiple suspects. After two people were killed at a block party shooting, 28 others injured. Here's the mayor. We won't stop until we find those responsible and hold them accountable. We won't. And in Wichita, Kansas, a shooting at a nightclub left nine people injured after police say multiple shooters opened fire early Sunday morning. Uh, here's a discouraging stat. The year-to-date total, the Gun Violence Archive reports 340 mass shootings in the U.S. so far this year. NBC's George Solis is on the ground in Baltimore. George, talk to us about the victims and the man manhunt for the suspects right there in Baltimore. Yeah, Tom, right now police are asking the community to come forward with information. They know people that attended this large annual block party gathering where the shooting took place had phones, had videos. They want to see that so they could find the people or shooters responsible for unloading on this crowd that was mainly comprised of teens, Tom. Frankly, that's what's upsetting to a lot of people in this community that so many of these wounded were just teenagers who were out there trying to have a good time. As for the victims, an 18-year-old woman identified as Aliyah Gonzalez and a 20-year-old man identified as Kylas Fekbemi. You see them on your screen there. Their families asking for privacy as they mourn. Many in the community not weighing in until they've had time to process this because for many, this is a shocking event. This was an event that was meant to sort of kick off the 4th of July celebrations and instead it is now an event of mourning. People are wondering why the police presence wasn't there because, again, as I mentioned, this is an event that takes place every year, and so police say they were going to be looking into that. You heard from Baltimore's mayor there issuing stern warning to the people responsible for this. At this point, we're learning there may have been multiple shooters, as we now know authorities recovered multiple shell casings and even multiple weapons at the scene, Tom. Here's a little bit more from the mayor. We are doing everything in our power to ensure uh, that the horrific violence that occurred this weekend is not repeated either in Brooklyn or any other neighborhood across Baltimore. Yeah, and you mentioned it, that staggering figure of the number of mass shootings that have taken place. A lot of people in Baltimore, and frankly, anywhere that we've seen these mass shootings pop up, are looking for accountability. They want some kind of resolution to prevent this from happening in their communities, Tom. Well, speaking of mass shootings, I know you've been trying to keep track also of the mass shooting in Wichita. What do you know on that one? Yeah, very briefly, this began as seven people that were injured. We now know that number is now to nine authorities arresting one person, a man from Missouri. There may be another shooter that they're looking for. Uh, 
details are slow to come in on this case. We now know that some of the victims were all uh, in their 20s, a 22-year-old, a 26-year-old. We know that the Wichita Police Department is also now working with several federal law enforcement agencies to get more information because, again, they really want answers, not just in that case, but also here in Baltimore as well. So a lot to unpack as this uh, weekend of the 4th of July celebrations really just unfolds with a lot more gun violence. Tom? Okay, George, thank you. George Solis in Baltimore. Now to the State Department, where the administration is supporting Israel's right to security while also cautioning against the loss of civilian life. The reaction coming after Israel launched its largest operation in the West Bank in more than a year of fighting, killing at least eight Palestinians in a refugee camp. The Israeli government says the attack is part of a counter-terrorism operation, with its military saying it found, quote, terrorist infrastructure inside the camp. Palestinians have been protesting and burning tires in Gaza. Palestinian leaders are calling the Israeli attacks a, quote, new war crime. It's all happening as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing increasing pressure within his own far-right government to conduct a broader military response to recent Palestinian attacks in the West Bank, including a shooting last week that killed four Israelis. Let's bring in NBC's Josh Letterman. Josh, uh, what more can you tell us about this latest Israeli operation and what could come next? Well, Tom, we are approaching 24 hours since this operation began uh, last night at about 1 a.m. Uh, in Israel and the occupied West Bank. And as of right now, this is not over. Throughout the day and into the evening, we've seen additional Israeli drone strikes. The military has said that they have gone over an explosives factory, as well as operational situation rooms used by Palestinian militants. They also say that they went into a mosque, the Israeli military saying that Palestinians inside the mosque were fighting. Firing at them, they then went inside and found not only arms and improvised explosive devices, but also they say uh, that Palestinians were building tunnels to use to carry out terror attacks. And the military has been saying that they had to go into Janine. They had to deal with this problem because they say uh, that there have been some 50 Palestinian terrorist attacks that have emanated from this one refugee camp uh, in Janine over the last many months. And they felt that it was time to go in and try to eliminate that threat not only to uh, Israel, but also specifically to uh, many of the Jewish settlers who uh, reside in the occupied West Bank. And so we heard from the Israeli military spokesman uh, a little while ago making clear that unlike some of the previous operations where Israel went in, they detained someone, they carried out a very specific operation, and then they got out as quickly as they possibly could, this time Israel plans to stay for as long as it takes. Take a listen. It could take hours, but it could also take days. We're focused on our goals. We're not here to conquer or hold the ground. When it's finished, we'll be out of there. And so that, of course, has many Palestinians on edge as we enter this second night since this raid began. Uh, but in the meanwhile, Tom, the Palestinians are making their outrage over these eight deaths, over the dozens of injuries, uh, well known, calling for a U.N. Security Council meeting. The Palestinian Authority also announcing that they are cutting off all communications with Israel, diplomatic security coordination, uh, any conversations with the Israeli government, they say must stop. They also say they're ripping up some previous agreements with Israel. Uh, Josh, an Israeli military official tells us, NBC News, that the U.S. was in fact informed of this operation before it was launched. And, and coming as tensions between the White House and Israel's government are really pretty high, right? That's right. They are pretty high. And in fact, in recent weeks, the U.S. repeatedly has criticized the Israeli government, not only over that controversial judicial overhaul that we've reported on, but also over Prime Minister Netanyahu's government announcing plans to expand settlements, allow Jewish settlers in the West Bank to build far more uh, homes in land that the Palestinians claim for a future independent state. But tonight, we actually saw Prime Minister Netanyahu not long ago at a 4th of July event on the eve of America's Independence Day, a lavishing praise on the U.S., on the friendship between the two countries, really trying to put a, a, a happy face on the state of this relationship. Uh, he was effusive in praising the outgoing U.S. ambassador to Israel, Tom Nides, uh, and really crediting the U.S. for helping prop up Israel's security. And we also heard from the U.S. government tonight saying that they stand behind Israel's right to self-defense. So both of these countries trying to put a, a brave and uh, an 
and happy face on the state of the relationship, even as there are definitely those tensions just under the surface, Tom. Okay, Josh, thanks. Josh Letterman, who's in London for us. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is heading to China later this week, part of the Biden administration's broader effort to improve relations between the world's two biggest economies. The trip was initially announced early this year, but was then put on hold after the U.S. shot down that alleged Chinese spy balloon back in February. A senior administration official says the big priority now is communication to prevent any, quote, misinterpretations and unintended consequences. The trip comes really at an uncertain time for both countries' economies. The U.S. may or may not be headed for a recession, while China loses economic momentum after rebounding from its zero-COVID restriction lockdowns. NBC White House correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now. Ali, we're not expecting any major breakthroughs to come out of this trip, but talk a little bit more about the focus and the timing here. Yeah, Tom, as far as the timing for this trip, the White House is laying it pretty straight. They're saying, a quote, uh, that this has felt like an appropriate time for us to get there and to be able to really make serious connections with Secretary Yellen's counterparts, this being Treasury Secretary Yellen's first trip to China in her role as Treasury Secretary. And administration officials are saying that her three official objectives that are going to take place while she's in China are, number one, the targeted action to secure national security interests, a healthy economic relationship with China, and cooperation on urgent challenges. But more broadly speaking, this is all part of a recent push from the Biden administration to strengthen relations with China because of what you laid out in your intro, intro there, how rocky relations and communications have been between the U.S. and China, especially since that Chinese spy balloon incident back in February and the prov provocations we've seen from China in the months since. We saw uh, um, I'm sorry, State, uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken's trip to China, that was seen as a major success, especially after months of trying to reschedule that trip in the aftermath of that uh, spy balloon incident. But since we saw last month that the president at a private fundraiser calling President Xi Jinping a dictator, that did not obviously go over well with Chinese officials. Uh, there's been this effort to steady the waters, to try and rekindle that communication between the countries, because because the overarching goal here is, you know, the U.S. and China don't need to agree on everything diplomatically, but they at least on both sides need to have the effort for more diplomatic relations, more communications. The administration hoping that this trip goes over well and potentially opens the door for more trips potentially by President Biden in the future. Well, we have another high-profile trip coming up, right? President Biden headed to the U.K., and he's going to be visiting with the prime minister there, Rishi Sunak, Sunak rather, as well as King Charles. So what more can you tell us about that? Yeah, the president heading to London to meet with King Charles for the first time since his inaugura uh, since his coronation. You'll remember the first lady attended that back in May. Uh, he'll also head to Finland. But while he's in London, he'll also meet with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. If that name sounds familiar to our viewers, that's because the president met with Rishi Sunak last month when he visited the White House. Uh, and these two announced a set of deals that will strengthen the relations, they say, between the U.S. and U.K. Uh, the White House putting out a statement that uh, this upcoming trip, these upcoming meetings with President Biden and uh, the King Charles, as well as the prime minister, will further uh, strengthen that relationship. All of this happening before the president heads to Lithuania for the NATO summit, Tom. Well, I was going to say, I bet Ukraine is going to be on the agenda for all of those. Uh, Ali, Absolutely. thank you very much. Ali Rafa, who's watching it from the White House. Here in Washington, police are releasing new pictures of a suspect in the attacks on three stores in D.C. over the weekend. Now, the suspect and perhaps others allegedly detonated devices outside a Nike store and a bank, then threw a Molotov cocktail through a Safeway window. Police say there were no injuries, adding that it appears the suspect targeted commercial establishments, and it does not appear to be uh, in any way targeting the public. NBC's Stephen Romo joins me now with more. Steve, what's the latest on this? We know the security video captured a car that police have associated with a suspect. Any idea if other suspects as well as what the motivation might be?
Yeah, pretty bizarre here. Right now, Tom, police are saying that they have no indication that there's anyone except this person that we see in these surveillance photos, in part because of the locations where this happened, along with the photos we have of this vehicle driving off, spotted at these three different locations. We also have a map laid out of where these places are, and the explosions happened within a span of about 15 minutes uh, from each other, starting at about 4 a.m. on Sunday. Sunday, then the other about five minutes later. Ten minutes after that, it was the Safeway grocery store. That was a different type of device. Police saying it was a Molotov, Molotov cocktail type device, and it was thrown into that Safeway, not injuring anyone, causing damage, though. The FBI is actually not involved in this because they say they don't suspect or don't have any reason to believe that this is involved in any type of terrorist organization. We do know, though, that D.C. police and the ATF together have $20,000 in reward money uh, leading to the apprehension of a suspect in this case. As for the motive, it is just unclear. No word of anything being taken here. These businesses seemingly unrelated. This bank, a shoe store, that Nike store, and that Safeway grocery store. A lot of questions the reason why, but the good news, no people seem to be injured in this, Tom. Yeah, that is good news. You know, I am in D.C., and if I look out the window right over the camera, I can see the Capitol building. Mm -hmm. So this is nowhere near the political institutions of Washington, right? This is in a separate area completely, and at this point, no indication that there were any political targets. Yeah, of course, whenever you hear D.C. being involved in anything uh, linked to explosions, that's something people are going to ask and wonder about. But thankfully, there's also been no indication from authorities that has anything to do with any political motivation. They do have some great leads to follow, though, specifically with that vehicle, including the license plate number. Yeah. Hopefully they can track down the person who did this and find out more of the motivation behind it, Tom. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Thank you, sir. Coming up from us, workers are walking off the job at major hotels in Southern California. What they want and how long they might be on strike. Plus, the U.S. is recommending Americans reconsider traveling to a very big country. We will explain that in our five things. Stay with us. Bottom of the hour, we want to take you out west right now, where thousands of hotel workers in Southern California are walking off the job and onto the picket line. They're demanding higher pay and better benefits just as the busy summer travel season picks up. They include room attendants, servers, desk agents, kitchen staff, all on strike during some pretty tense negotiations between the union and major hotel chains, including the Intercontinental, Hilton, Marriott, the list goes on. NBC's Steve Patterson is following all of this from L.A. Steve, what's the latest now on these protests and how is this affecting visitors who are trying to stay there? Well, as you made reference to, and perhaps nobody knows better than you, Tom, this is one of the busiest travel weekends of the year. So here you have 15,000 workers in very integral parts of the hotel chain process striking across more than 60 hotels. I imagine it's making a huge difference when you talk about delays as far as the front desk, because you've got managers instead of workers there, housekeeping, managers instead of workers there, mm. perhaps even in the kitchen where a lot of these workers were. Uh, they are demanding, they're basically saying, that, look, the amount that we're making does not live up to the cost of living, especially in a place like Los Angeles or several places across Orange County. Uh, and so, obviously, they want better health care. They want those retirement benefits. That's all sort of part of the package. What they're really after, though, immediately is an increase. They want a bump. They're making currently probably around $20 to $25 an hour. They want a $5 increase immediately and then installments of $3 as far as this contract continues. This is expected to last as long as it takes to reach a negotiation at the table. Um, but until then, we spoke to workers who told us what sort of more they want on top of this. Here's what they're saying on the line. Listen to this. We want to make sure that the workers that make that what it is um, are able to stay healthy and house. Since the pandemic, they start cutting people. We have been having a lot of workloads on top of us. Sometimes we end up doing the work of two or three people. 
So on top of this, you know, the bargaining group that is representing these hotel chains says, look, we came to the table, we offered something pretty good as a counter, but the union didn't respond to us as early as last week leading up into this. Their argument is that all the union was interested in is striking, making a big stink, and then doing it that way instead of trying to find the best solution for their workers. Tom? You know, objectively, you got to think, yeah, I mean, the cost of living in L.A. across the whole country, but L.A. has exploded. Yeah. It might be pretty tough to get by on 20, 25 bucks an hour there. Now, the hotel industry just recovered from the COVID pandemic, huge return of customers, and now this. This could not be good for the hotel industry that's just now getting back on its feet. No, no, but that's part of the argument from the union is that finally, especially this weekend, but certainly in the past, in the past few months or so, we've seen a return from COVID to uh, levels of guests who are returning to these hotels, to the profits that they're making. And then they're saying that they're not accounting for the inflation, for cost of living, that the hotels are simply not adjusting for the needs of their workers. And that's why they're striking. And that's why they're maximizing this strike mm. by doing it now. Tom. And anybody who stayed at a hotel lately knows the costs of a hotel room have really just gone through the roof. Uh, sure Steve, has. thanks. Steve Patterson, who's out in L.A. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks that you should know about tonight. Number one, police are charging a South Carolina, Carolina man with the attempted murder of the only survivor of a house fire over the weekend. The local sheriff's department says they found six bodies at the home and one person in critical condition. More charges are possible against a 33-year-old suspect pending autopsy results. Number two, Americans planning to travel to, to China are being warned to reconsider those trips, at least at the risk of a wrongful detention. No specific cases were cited, but the advisory coming just a few weeks after a 78-year-old U.S. citizen was arrested and sentenced to life in prison on charges of spying. Number three, over the weekend, Elon Musk said Twitter users will only be able to read a certain number of posts per day because of data scraping. The limits are apparently temporary, and if you're paying a Twitter Blue user, you can see more, you can see more rather than people who have unverified accounts. Thousands of users reported issues with the site. Twitter rival Blue Sky said it got record high traffic on Saturday after Twitter's change. Number four, NASCAR took over the city of Chicago this weekend for the first ever Loop 121 and Grant Park 220 races. 38 cars ripped through the city streets up to 140 miles per hour. It's part of a push by NASCAR to diversify its fan base and attract more city dwellers to the sport. Number five, tonight's Powerball jackpot is topping half a billion dollars. Nobody's hit all the numbers since April. Somebody's bound to get rich tonight, right, Bert? Bert's off to my left. The drawing is tonight, but if you can't get a ticket, there's a $400 million Mega Millions jackpot. It's a consolation prize, and that's up for grab tomorrow. When we come back, a romance scam. In fact, several are really taking a heartbreaking turn, and two people shared their stories with NBC News to despite the stigma. We're talking to the reporter behind that for our backstory tonight. All right, and Novak Djokovic is going for his fifth straight Wimbledon championship. What, if anything, is standing in his way? That's coming up later in the hour. Okay, time now to get to the backstory, which is our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together at NBC and how it fits into our bigger picture. Online romance scams are raking in millions of dollars taken from people who had no idea that they were being taken advantage of until it was too late. And it's pushing some victims so devastated by what they've lost to self-harm. In a new NBC News report, our Kevin Collier talked to two people who know that situation well. Norm Jones, who survived a suicide attempt earlier this year, and Ashley, whose father ended up dying by suicide in January. Jones says his online girlfriend became a major part of his life. They talked every day for months. He would write her songs, and she would push him to invest money through a crypto website. It was only later that Jones realized the $250,000 he'd invested, along with his life savings and retirement, were gone. And there wasn't much that could be done about it. In March, first responders found him unconscious in his bathroom after he attempted suicide. 
And Ashley, she told Kevin she had no idea her dad was involved in a romance investment scam until he was already gone. She pieced most of it all together by looking through his phone. She saw that over the course of four months, someone her dad considered an online romantic partner convinced him to dump around $500,000 into a fake scheme. And it's not just them. According to the AARP's Fraud Watch Network, referring victims to a suicide hotline has become a, quote, daily occurrence. NBC's Kevin Collier joins me now. Kevin, you know, this is just heartbreaking to hear these stories. Despite the stigma around this, Jones and Ashley decided to share their stories with you. How did you find them? First of all, how did you find them? And then how did you get them to open up about something that was so personal and sensitive? Well, you know, I, I cover stuff like this, and I'm constantly speaking with law enforcement, with, with people who track scams. And uh, I've been hearing whispers for a long time. This isn't just you know, hurting people's pocketbooks. It's literally killing people. So it took a while of, you know, a lot of people who are prosecutors who work in this space, they're, they're not going to just like say, you know, hey, here's the number of somebody uh, who's in this, you know, who's gone through everything like this. But I will give them my name and number and tell them, you know, reach out if they're, if they're willing to share their story. And there's a long process of that. Uh, and we went through, you know, it, it was months putting this all together. Um, but eventually I was able to convince these two to just speak with me on the record using their real names to share the most awful thing that could possibly happen. What did those conversations look like? They, they were brutal. I mean, you know, I, I cover cybersecurity. That, that's my, my day job. Um, and we, you know, I don't often get into the people talking about things this this deep. I'm I'll tell you this, I, I spoke with Norm for hours, hours and hours, um, the, you know, the person who, who attempted uh, to die. And I'm not really much of a crier. I could not hold back when he was kind of walking me through the, the darkest moments. He, he really thought he had lost everything. He had not. He has friends and family who still love him, even though he's lost you know, all his financial, uh, almost everything he, he owns materially. Um, but it was, it was really rough and, and, and really dark. You know, I guess the FBI's most recent stats say that the total losses are of more than, there are total losses of about $3 billion, uh, double what they were in 2021. It, it's happened a lot, right? I mean, regardless, there's still the stigma because we've all been warned, don't fall prey to this. And that's something that you saw even when you were publishing this article? Yeah, I mean, I posted the story on, on social media, and, and you saw people saying, you know, hey, why would a cybersecurity expert fall for this sort of thing? I mean, Norm's only been the first cybersecurity expert that I personally have spoken with who has lost hundreds of thousands of dollars to this scam. It gets people. Uh, it, I think Wait, cybersecurity the... experts? Cybersecurity yes. experts? Yes. You, you, you know of several who have fallen prey. Yes. Yes. It's... It cashes in on on the hype around crypto. You, you'll get the scammers can be incredibly articulate and specific. The, the scam itself is very very convincing. You th some in some cases they'll let you pull out money. You say, oh, can I can I pull out the five thousand I invested? Or you know, it made me an additional ten. Can I pull that out? And the scammers will let you do that. And it's only yeah. once the scammer has invested so much, hundreds of thousands of dollars, that they really put the squeeze on, and and you can't withdraw your money anymore. And, and there's always the there's always this human element, isn't there? There's always this human uh, who is impact impacted in some way by these stories. Uh, but sometimes it's just so much more personal. H how did this story differ from other pieces that you report on? Because this one really does involve people's lives, their feelings, their emotions, their well-being, and then suicide. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Tom, I uh, I cover hackers and, and scammers almost every day. Uh, and we're always looking for what is the real human harm. Somebody might say, you know, a, a school got hacked and your kids' names and, and their personal information was leaked. And that can be profoundly creepy, but you don't always necessarily see an immediate impact to that. You know, they, they, the kids can go on, on with their lives. This was particularly powerful because we're talking about literally people who, who feel like they have nothing left because the scam yeah. is so so impactful, so so powerful. And it's I hope a, people it's a good realize, morning. by the way, that uh, the reason why these people shared these stories with me, with the world, is to help dispel some of that stigma. NBCnews.com is Kevin's reporter, uh, reporting, rather. Kevin, thank you very much. If you or someone you know is in a crisis, call or text this number on your screen, 988, or text the word HOME to the crisis text line, 741-741.
Coming up, a new way to battle wildfires to focus on protecting the people who are fighting those fires. We will explain that after the break. Guess what? Wimbledon officially got underway today with Novak Djokovic going for his fifth straight and eighth overall men's singles championship. He won his first round match today in straight sets after a short rain delay. Djokovic even did a brief stint as a groundskeeper using his towel to help dry the grass on center court. Nice of him. Meanwhile, 43-year-old Venus Williams today with a big scare, screaming in pain. Uh, after clutching her knee there, she slipped on the grass just three games into her Wimbledon return. But the five-time Wimbledon champ refused to quit, went on to finish her match, losing to Ukrainian Alina Svitlone. Sorry, Svitlone. Svitlina? How do I say it, Bert? Svitlina? There we go. Okay, another American seven-seeded Coco Goff was also knocked out on the first round of the tournament today in an upset loss to Sophia Kennan. All right, Andrew Krasny is joining us now. Help me with the name. I should know this, but I don't. I'm trying to remember. How do you, <laughs> you, are how doing do you great, say her Tom. name? You are doing oh. great, Tom. It's Alina Svitolina, and she's married to Gael Monfils. They just had a baby, and she won, uh, she's won a title since she's become a mom. So we're keeping a close eye on her. Yeah, everybody's got these, uh, you know, 13-syllable names. Hey, listen, speaking of which, uh, Djokovic actually isn't even at the top seed at Wimbledon, right? Despite going for men's record extending 24th Grand Slam title, H how is the men's bracket shaping up right now? Okay, well, I'll tell you, there's one guy at Wimbledon this year who can beat Novak Djokovic. I'll give you one guess who it is, Tom, and it is, are you ready? Boris only Becker. Novak Djokovic. <laughs> no, I think it's only Novak Djokovic, to be honest with you. Uh, he's unbeatable. I think there's only one person who can beat him. That's himself. Really? Novak, who's been ranked number one in the world. He's not one right now. He's maybe just a few points shy of uh, regaining that number one ranking. A, a record 389 weeks. He's, uh, he's won an incredible 24 majors, or 23 majors, going for his 24th. He's unstoppable. And I think... We're about to see perfection as he continues to break records. Now, he is astonishing. Uh, tell us now who we should be watching for on the women's side. And there may not be a lot of names that I can pronounce, right? But walk us through that. Okay, well, there's Iga Shiantek, who's number one in the world, who's showing everybody at 21, 22 years old that she is virtually unbeatable. But uh, there are some people who can do some damage against her. We're talking, of course, uh, uh, Elena Rabakina, who's the defending champion. She is from Kazakhstan. She's a tough player, plays really well in grass. Anjabur, who made it to two finals and Grand Slams last year, U.S. Open and Wimbledon. She's the most successful era player in WTA history. She's very crafty on grass. She's one of those who can be dangerous against herself. She tends to get a little nervous in the, in the very important matches. So we're keeping an eye on Anjabur. Uh, Sophia Kennan. Sophia Kennan just beat Coco Goff today. She's a Grand Slam champion. So on the women's side, it's still very tough, but even on the men's side, you're looking at Carlos Alcaraz, Stefano Tsitsipas, Francis Tiafo. There's a ton of storylines that can develop. Today's only the first day. Only the first day. Andrew, thank you very much. Andrew Krasny, who is covering it all for us. Uh, NBC covers hundreds of stories each day, and because you can't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you and for me. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions. We call it the local. From our Northeast Bureau, emergency teams in New Hampshire say at least 14 people were hurt after a car crashed into a busy restaurant. The fire department found the car inside the Looney Bin Bar and Grill Sunday afternoon. One man was pinned inside the bathroom. The cause of the crash still under investigation. Out of our Southern Bureau, Rudy Farias disappeared eight years ago when he was a teenager. Investigators say he turned up alive over the weekend. He's now 25 years old, and the Texas Center for the Missing says he's recovering in a hospital. He was last seen walking his dogs in March of 2015, and his dogs came home without him. It's not clear where he's been or, or why he left. Also from our Southern Bureau, Bureau. This roller coaster at a North Carolina amusement park shut down after someone spotted a crack. Now you see it in the support beam as the roller coaster goes around the curve. The park said that it's inspecting the ride, that it will be closed until it's fixed. Cracks aren't good on support beams. Not good. 
Turning now to a tragic anniversary, you know, it's been 10 years since a group of firefighters, elite firefighters, were killed badly in an out-of-control wildfire in Prescott, Arizona. 19 hotshot firefighters, a quarter of the local fire department, died on June 30th, 2013. Now, the Yarnell Hill fire remains the deadliest fire in the last 80 years and the largest loss of firefighter lives since September 11th. It was a devastating tragedy with long-lasting impacts on the community. It was also a turn turning point in how fire crews everywhere battle large, uncontrollable blazes. Our Lindsay Reiser was a reporter in Phoenix at the time, and she has this story. Ten years ago, Prescott, Arizona, a small city 90 minutes north of Phoenix, became known for what it lost. 19 highly trained Granite Mountain hotshots died while fighting the Yarnell Hill fire just south of Prescott. You remember every detail of what you wore that day to what you were doing the second you found out. Alicia Moffitt was engaged to 22-year-old Wade Parker, who was in his rookie season with the elite wildland fighter fighting group. They were called to fight an explosive fire threatening homes in nearby Yarnell, spitting out flames as high as 20 feet. The crew lost communication and left their safe zone when the fast-moving fire changed directions, trapping the hot shots. They were forced to deploy their emergency shelters. All but the lone lookout perished. I went from planning our wedding that was going to be two months from then to literally planning his funeral and trying to attend 18 other funerals on top of that. It is still the deadliest U.S. wildfire in 80 years and the largest loss of firefighters' lives since September 11th. We recognize when you lose a quarter of your department, what that means to you on a human level is completely different. Prescott Fire Chief Holger Durr says due in part to this disaster, their approach to how they fight fire has changed. We don't deploy a bunch of firefighters to the tip of a hurricane. When the hurricane comes, we we'll wait for the hurricane to come through, and then, you know, we rescue people after that. And with fires burning hotter, faster, and becoming more unpredictable thanks to climate change, according to fire forecasters, it's a strategy focused on protecting lives and learning to live with the dangers of wildfires. If we can't succeed, we're going to step back and find a, a better approach, a better strategy. And our highest priority is um, life safety, firefighter and public safety. Technology has advanced. Communication and fire tracking have also improved, fire personnel tell us. And now departments like Prescott are using drones. In dangerous situations, they can scout trouble spots from above, replacing the need for boots on the ground reshaping how communities fight forest fires as they honor and grieve the men who gave their lives, protecting one they loved. I just hope they remember who these guys outside of their job were, husbands and brothers and sons and this crew that went there together and they died together and they all stayed together. Lindsay Reiser, NBC News. Yeah, it is steamy in Cleveland. Hot enough for you? We are coming on the air as at least one in five Americans is now facing some kind of extreme weather threat. We got severe storms, hail, flooding, record-breaking heat. We'll get into what the brutal weather means wherever you're feeling it for the July 4th celebrations and for the trip home over the holiday. Tensions are also rising in the Middle East after at least eight people were killed in an Israeli drone attack. The latest reaction coming into us just before we came on the air. And then the hunt for suspects on a holiday weekend shooting in Baltimore that left two people dead, more than two dozen wounded. What police are telling the public today about that incident. And thousands of hotel workers are starting up the picket lines right now after going on strike. Their demands and what the walkout means for the industry and for your next vacation in Southern Cal. In the backstory, how heartbreak is costing some people just about everything. Why victims of online romance scams are now speaking out about what they went through and the warning signs you should look out for, for you and also maybe a loved one. That's later in the show. Hey there, I'm Tom Costello in for Hallie, and we start tonight with 36 million people facing the threat of severe storms up and down the East Coast, and then especially in the Midwest and the midsection of the country. 
Take Chicago. The rains there have gotten so bad, the city is recovering from some huge flooding tonight. You see it right there. Cars submerged after days of downpours. Other parts of the country are also getting slammed. Take a look at what a storm did in Lexington, Kentucky. Power lines pulled down. Giant trees ripped from their roots from the sheer force of that storm. Tens of thousands are still without power in Lexington. If it's not pouring, hailing, or gusting where you are, chances are the temperatures outside could be brutal with another 33 million under heat alerts right now. Now, none of this is helpful if you're one of the millions traveling around the country for the July 4th holiday. Flight delays are expected to creep up over the next 48 hours as airports in some big cities contend with all of this. So let's bring in now the folks who are covering this. NBC's Danny Griffin is in Santa Monica, California. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman also is joining us. Danny, can we start out with you? You've been talking about extreme heat uh, right there in Santa Monica. You're seen in the, in the heart of California. So what's it feel like? What's the burn feel like right now? Well, I have to say here, Tom, we are very lucky because it's only 70 degrees. So you've wait, got a wait, lot of wait, people wait, that wait, are wait. heading what? just even 70. 20 miles inland. <laughs> 70. 70. I know, it's 70. 70. Are you kidding me? We really got the worst assignment here. <laughs> But, Tom, I mean, that's why you got people who are even just coming 20 miles from inland just to try to get 10, 20 degrees cooler. And that's why thousands of people are here, because they want to beat the heat. We even had people travel from out of the state. One woman uh, was a little surprised about what she walked into uh, when she showed up this morning. Listen. I kind of like it because it's escaping the heat. We're from Michigan, so it's very hot there right now. It's nice to get the breeze, and it's, it's good. And, and Tom, re remember, there's still a lot of areas that are still dealing with that severe heat, very dangerous conditions. So the message here is to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Uh, some areas from Washington to Arizona could get up to 110, 120 degrees. So it is still very dangerous out there. And we have to consider ourselves very lucky considering what others are experiencing, not only in parts of the West, but other parts of the country. Here I was feeling sorry for you, thinking you're baking and it's 70 degrees and people are wearing a fleece out there. Listen, you're talking about and tracking another story right there as well, right? Uh, we're talking about the impact yeah. humans are having on the environment and we have a toxic algae bloom that's poisoning ocean mammals like sea lions. Yeah, Tom, it's so sad to see you. We actually saw one sea lion that we think may potentially be sick with that toxic algae bloom. What's happening is these smaller sea mammals are eating the, the algae, which has become toxic from a lot of the runoff that us humans have caused here in our oceans. And when those sea lions and dolphins eat the fish, they're becoming sick. It's causing like a neuro, uh, a neurological uh, toxin to them, and they're becoming sick. Some have even died. But the bigger concern is what happens after they've been sick, they become aggressive, Tom, and that's why there's a, a big warning for people to stay away from these sea lions. And even just four miles south down in Marina del Rey, some residents there are trying to stop the 4th of July fireworks celebrations because those sea lions that are being rehabilitated in a pen nearby this barge that will be setting off those 4th of July fireworks may cause more concern for those sick animals. Take a listen. Pretty devastating, having things like seizures, not being able to like swim very well, um, and even resulting in like death. People are you know, taking selfies with them, and you know all these. You know, this is not a it's not a photo op for Instagram. It's like a real um, situation with this algae bloom. And it really is a serious situation. A lot of people come in from out of town. They see a sea lion for the first time and think, oh, I want to go up. They look cute, but they are mean, especially if they've been impacted with this toxic algae. So officials are warning people do not take selfies, do not approach them, stay far away. And they really want people to enjoy uh, this 4th of July. Um, you know, one thing I have to mention, wildfire season is a huge concern, especially now. You know, we had that record rainfall earlier this year. So we've got a lot of growth, but now... It's been hot, it's been dry, and that could become fuel for wildfires. So for people that are celebrating, they're asking them not to set off illegal fireworks and to stay safe this holiday. Tom?
All right, Dana. Thank you very much, Dana Griffin. Uh, let's bring in now our meteorologist, Michelle Grossman. I think we found the one person in the country who's actually not overheating at this very moment <laughs> if she's in Santa Monica. Give us the coast to coast picture right now. I will. Hi there, Tom. I know it's 70 degrees and she's looking very fresh and pretty. So uh, <laughs> lucky for her. But yes, lots of us are sweltering in the heat. A lot of us are dodging storms and showers today. Radar really telling this whole story, really blossoming this afternoon to the evening and overnight hours. We have storms anywhere from the Intermountain West to the Northern Plains, parts of the Midwest, the Central and Southern Plains, over to the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, New England. So most of us seeing some scattered showers. We're seeing some really heavy rainfall with this too, those summer-like storms where you see those brighter colors, that's where we're seeing the heaviest rainfall. And we're seeing lightning, we're hearing thunder, and we have the risk for severe storms as we continue to go throughout the rest of this Monday. Notice all this yellow here. Those are severe thunderstorm watches. They come from the individual weather offices, and we're seeing them all up and down the East Coast. And these little orange boxes where you see those really bright colors in between, that's where we're seeing the severe thunderstorms happening right now. So really starting to blossom. We're going to continue to watch this, but lots of us seeing those scattered storms. Still 34 million people at risk to see some strong thunderstorms, severe thunderstorms, with winds gusting over 60 miles per hour. It's not out of the question to see a 70 mile per hour wind gust, 80 mile per, uh, per hour wind gust, and portions of the, uh, the northern plains into the inner mountain west. Could see some hail as well, low tornado threat, but not zero, so we're going to keep that in mind as well. Big cities, Tom, where you are, D.C., Richmond. We're looking at Philadelphia, New York City. Charlotte could see some strong to severe thunderstorms as we go throughout the rest of today. That's not just today, though. We're going to see the chance for that tomorrow as well. Not as high along the East Coast, but still a chance. And then we're looking at some strong storms throughout portions of the Midwest into the Central Plains. Uh, we're looking at enhanced risk as well. We could see winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Tom? Hey, listen, so we have the 4th of July tomorrow with everybody watching the skies for those fireworks. Uh, are we likely to see cancellations anywhere? And what would we expect? Where would you expect to see that? Yeah, unfortunately we are because we are looking at those scattered storms in addition to that heat. So as we look at the fireworks forecast over the next, uh, over tomorrow into tomorrow evening, lots of soggy conditions during the day, severe risk throughout the Intermountain West into the Northern Plains, still hot. But look what happens by 9 o'clock, still sweltering in portions of the Southwest, 99 degrees if you're out there watching some fireworks there. But we're going to have clear skies, so we're going to take that. Los Angeles, we're also going to be dry, dry throughout uh, Boise, Salt Lake City. But notice as you go throughout the middle of the country into the Southeast, the Mid-Atlantic, the Carolinas, most of us have the chance to see a shower or two, especially where you see this darker color here. That's where we're going to see those heavy, heavy downpours. Any of these downpours, very summer-like, we're going to see the chance for flash flooding as well. So Minneapolis, you have the chance of seeing some storms. Same story in uh, the Northeast to the Mid-Atlantic, the Carolinas. We're not talking about total washout, but still some fireworks will be impacted from Boston to New York to D.C. and also to Atlanta. Tom? Didn't Mark Twain say the coldest winter I ever spent was in August in, uh, in San Francisco? And look at that, 60 degrees <laughs> right. tomorrow in San Francisco. It's that water influence, that Pacific influence. <laughs> Yeah, Michelle, thank yeah. you very much. Michelle sure. Grossman. All right, now to the latest uh, on gun violence and a surge in gun violence. Two mass shootings this weekend. First to Baltimore, where police are searching for multiple suspects after two people were killed at a block party, 28 others wounded. Here's the mayor of Baltimore. We won't stop until we find those responsible and hold them accountable. We won't. Okay, and over in Wichita, Kansas, a shooting at a nightclub left nine people injured after police say multiple shooters opened fire early Sunday morning. There's a discouraging stat to share. The year-to-date total on gun violence, at least from the Gun Violence Archive, shows that 340 mass shootings have happened so far this year. 340. NBC's George Solis is on the ground in Baltimore. George, give us the latest now on the victims and the manhunt for these suspects in Baltimore. Yeah, Tom, the numbers really are staggering. Police are asking anyone in the community that may have seen anything to please come forward because right now they have no suspects, no motive, at least what they're saying publicly. This was a large block party event, a lot of teens in attendance. Half of those wounded were just teens. The youngest, about 13 years old, the two victims in this shooting, an 18-year-old woman named Aaliyah Gonzalez and a 20-year-old man named Kylas Fegbemi. Their families asking for privacy, a lot in the community reserving their words as they are still processing this grief. And again, the outrage in this community is over the number of young victims here, as well as the lack of police presence, according to the community. This is an annual block party. It brings in a lot of people. 
Residents there tell us they did not see the large police presence that they normally do. Police, for their part, say they were adequately staffed. They just didn't know about this event because it took place at a time that they simply didn't know or weren't made aware of. So they say they'll be looking into that. Uh, you mentioned Baltimore's mayor. He is irate. He has had some strong words over the weekend about this shooting, saying he will not rest until the people, the shooters, are apprehended. Take a listen to what he said this afternoon. We are doing everything in our power to ensure uh, that the horrific violence that occurred this weekend is not repeated either in Brooklyn or any other neighborhood across Baltimore. Again, you hear the outrage in his voice. We spoke with a woman who attended the block party. She says that she actually drove two young women who were injured to the hospital, and she said she would hope that other people would have done the same in that scenario. Again, this community has been gripped by violence, and they just want some accountability, Tom. Uh, George, you've also been trying to follow the, the mass shooting in Wichita from your vantage point. What are you, what are you picking up about Wichita? Yeah, police uh, updating the case a little bit ago. It started with a report of seven injured. We now know that number has now been upgraded to nine. Two people driving themselves to the hospital. At least two people may have been trampled. You mentioned it earlier. There may have been multiple shooters in this case. So far, authorities saying they've arrested one man, 31-year-old Brandon Young of Florissant, Missouri. More cases, uh, more investigating will be done on this case. The victims' ages ranging from 25 to a 34-year-old male. Federal authorities also investigating in that case, as they are in this one here in Baltimore. Tom. Okay, George Solis from Baltimore PD. Thank you very much. Now to the State Department, where the administration is supporting Israel's right to security, while also cautioning against the loss of civilian life. The reaction coming after Israel launched its largest operation in the West Bank in more than a year of fighting, killing at least eight Palestinians at a refugee camp. The Israeli government says the attack is part of a counter-terrorism operation with its military saying it found, quote, terrorist infrastructure inside the camp. Palestinians have been protesting and burning tires in Gaza. Palestinian leaders are calling the Israeli attacks a, quote, new war crime. It's all happening as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing increased pressure within his own far-right government to conduct a broader military response to recent Palestinian attacks in the West Bank, including a shooting last week that killed four Israelis. NBC's Josh Letterman joins us now. Josh, uh, what more can you tell us about this latest Israeli operation and what could come next? Well, Tom, we are approaching 24 hours since this operation began uh, last night at about 1 a.m. Uh, in Israel and the occupied West Bank. And as of right now, this is not over. Throughout the day and into the evening, we've seen additional Israeli drone strikes. The military has said that they have gone over an explosives factory, as well as operational situation rooms used by Palestinian militants. They also say that they went into a mosque, the Israeli military, saying that Palestinians inside the mosque were fired at them. They then went inside and found not only arms and improvised explosive devices, but also they say uh, that Palestinians were building tunnels to use to carry out terror attacks. And the military has been saying that they had to go into Janine. They had to deal with this problem because they say uh, that there have been some 50 Palestinian terrorist attacks that have emanated from this one refugee camp uh, in Janine over the last many months. And they felt that it was time to go in and try to eliminate that threat not only to uh, Israel, but also specifically to uh, many of the Jewish settlers who uh, reside in the occupied West Bank. And so we heard from the Israeli military spokesman uh, a little while ago making clear that unlike some of the previous operations where Israel went in, they detained someone, they carried out a very specific operation, and then they got out as quickly as they possibly could, this time Israel plans to stay for as long as it takes. Take a listen. It could take hours, but it could also take days. We're focused on our goals. We're not here to conquer or hold the ground. When it's finished, we'll be out of there. 
And so that, of course, has many Palestinians on edge as we enter this second night since this raid began. Uh, but in the meanwhile, Tom, the Palestinians are making their outrage over these eight deaths, over the dozens of injuries, uh, well known, calling for a U.N. Security Council meeting. The Palestinian Authority also announcing that they are cutting off all communications with Israel, diplomatic security coordination, uh, any conversations with the Israeli government, they say must stop. They also say they're ripping up some previous agreements with Israel. Uh, Josh, an Israeli military official tells us, NBC News, that the U.S. was in fact informed of this operation before it was launched. And, and coming as tensions between the White House and Israel's government are really pretty high, right? That's right. They are pretty high. And in fact, in recent weeks, the U.S. repeatedly has criticized the Israeli government, not only over that controversial judicial overhaul that we've reported on, but also over Prime Minister Netanyahu's government announcing plans to expand settlements, allow Jewish settlers in the West Bank to build far more uh, homes in land that the Palestinians claim for a future independent state. But tonight, we actually saw Prime Minister Netanyahu not long ago at a Fourth of July event on the eve of America. America's Independence Day, a lavishing praise on the U.S., on the friendship between the two countries, really trying to put a, a, a happy face on the state of this relationship. Uh, he was effusive in praising the outgoing U.S. ambassador to Israel, Tom Nides, uh, and really crediting the U.S. for helping prop up Israel's security. And we also heard from the U.S. government tonight saying that they stand behind Israel's right to self-defense. So both of these countries trying to put a, a brave and, uh, and happy face on the state of the relationship, even as there are the Definitely those tensions just under the surface, Tom. Okay, Josh, thanks. Josh Letterman, who's in London for us. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is heading to China later this week, part of the Biden administration's broader effort to improve relations between the world's two biggest economies. The trip was initially announced earlier this year, but it was then put on hold after the U.S. shot down that Chinese spy balloon back in February. A senior administration official tells NBC News the big priority now is communication to prevent any, quote, misinterpretations and unintended consequences. The trip comes at an uncertain time for both countries' economies. The U.S. may or may not be headed for a recession, while China is losing economic momentum after rebounding from its zero COVID restriction lockdowns. NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa joins me now. Ali, uh, you had China's President Xi and Secretary of State Blinken meeting a couple of weeks ago, saying that this is an important start to stabilizing relations. Is the timing here an effort to keep that momentum going? Yeah, Tom, that's absolutely part of the overall reason behind this trip, uh, because we saw after Secretary Blinken's uh, meeting with President Xi in Beijing, that momentum, that progress that was months in the making trying to get that trip back on the books after that Chinese spy balloon incident, that momentum was potentially threatened uh, by uh, that of private fundraiser where the president last month called President Xi a dictator, which, of course, did not go over well with Chinese uh, officials. So there's absolutely an effort behind this uh, meeting, this trip by Treasury Secretary Yellen uh, to reaffirm this relationship between China and the United States to strengthen these ties and keep these lines of communication that uh, have been struggling for the last few months back open. Uh, the White House's official response to the timing piece of this is they say that there is no better time than now for Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen to head to China to strengthen relationships between her and her counterparts in China, uh, with this being her first trip to China in her role as Treasury Secretary. Uh, but they are taming expectations. Uh, one administration official uh, saying that, uh, quote, we don't expect significant breakthroughs stemming from this initial travel in Instead, uh, they say that her main three objectives while being in China is to uh, target action to secure national security interests, to develop a healthy economic relationship with China, with, of course, China and the United States representing the world's two largest economies. And, she sa and they say that the third uh, target will be cooperation on urgent challenges. But no doubt, Tom, broad, more broadly, uh, this is all an effort by the Biden administration to strengthen these relations, to build on communication that's already been established to potentially open the door for more administration officials, potentially the president himself, to eventually visit Beijing. Well, speaking of the president, he's also making a big trip coming up right next week to the U.K. He'll be visiting with the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and King Charles. Talk to us about what we can expect. 
Yeah, the White House announcing that before the president heads to that NATO summit in Lithuania, after that he'll head to a Nordic leader summit in Finland, he will stop in London to meet with King Charles. Uh, that coming after uh, we know the first lady attended uh, King Charles's coronation back in May, but the president stayed behind in Washington. Uh, so this will be his first trip back to London since attending Queen Elizabeth's funeral back in September. Uh, the White House also says he will meet with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, that coming uh, after we know that uh, Sunak visited the White House just last month, where these two announced uh, a set of deals that uh, would help both the UK and the US's economies. They both reaffirmed their support behind Ukraine as it continues uh, its war with Russia. So no doubt that will be brought up, as we know, just days later, the president will then attend that NATO summit in Lithuania, Tom. Okay, Ali, thank you. Ali Roth at the White House. Here in Washington, police are releasing new pictures of a suspect in the attacks on three stores in D.C. over the weekend. The suspect and perhaps others allegedly detonated devices outside a Nike store and a bank, then threw a Molotov cocktail through a Safeway window. Police say there were no injuries, adding that it appears the suspect targeted commercial establishments, and it does not appear the suspect was targeting any members of the public. NBC Stephen Romo joins me now. Steve, what's the latest on this? We know the security video captured a car that police have associated with a suspect. Any idea if other suspects as well as what the motivation might be? Yeah, pretty bizarre here. Right now, Tom, police are saying that they have no indication that there's anyone except this person that we see in these surveillance photos, in part because of the locations where this happened, along with the photos we have of this vehicle driving off, spotted at these three different locations. We also have a map laid out of where these places are, and the explosions happen within a span of about 15 minutes uh, from each other, starting at about 4 a.m. on on Sunday, then the other about five minutes later. Ten minutes after that, it was the Safeway grocery store. That was a different type of device. Police saying it was a Molotov, Molotov cocktail type device, and it was thrown into that Safeway, not injuring anyone, causing damage, though. The FBI is actually not involved in this because they say they don't suspect or don't have any reason to believe that this is involved in any type of terrorist organization. We do know, though, that D.C. police and the ATF together have $20,000 in reward money uh, leading to the apprehension of a suspect in this case. As for the motive, it is just unclear. No word of anything being taken here. These businesses seemingly unrelated. This bank, a shoe store, that Nike store, and that Safeway grocery store. A lot of questions the reason why, but the good news, no people seem to be injured in this, Tom. Yeah, that is good news. You know, I am in D.C., and if I look out the window right over the camera, I can see the Capitol building. So this is nowhere near the political institutions of Washington, right? This is in a separate area completely, and at this point, no indication that there were any political targets. Yeah, of course, whenever you hear D.C. being involved in anything uh, linked to explosions, that's something people are going to ask and wonder about. But thankfully, there's also been no indication from authorities that has anything to do with any political motivation. They do have some great leads to follow, though, specifically with that vehicle, including the license plate number. Yeah. Hopefully they can track down the person who did this and find out more of the motivation behind it, Tom. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Thank you, sir. Coming up, a family tragedy for Robert De Niro. What we know now about the death of his grandson. We're back. Hollywood actors are not going to go on strike, at least not yet. Their new deadline for a new contract coming up in just a few minutes. But first from us, we take you out west, where right now thousands of hotel workers in Southern Cal are walking off the job and onto the picket line. Now, they're demanding higher pay and better benefits, just as the busy summer travel season picks up. They include room attendants, servers, desk agents, kitchen staff all on strike during some pretty tense negotiations between the union and major hotel chains, including the Intercontinental, Hilton, Marriott. The list goes on. NBC Steve Patterson is following all of this from L.A. All right, Steve, what's the latest now on these protests, and how is this affecting the visitors who may be booked and trying to spend the night there? 
Yeah, uh, protests ongoing, Tom, and as you mentioned, in one of the busiest travel weekends of the year, it, as you mentioned again, some of the biggest hotel chains in Southern California, west of the Mississippi. So a huge disruption for travelers, especially when you have these positions that are so key, so crucial to a hotel's operation now being staffed by essentially managers and temporary workers. So huge disruption. But that's the point. These workers wanted to get across that the wages simply aren't matching the cost of living. And we've seen this in other industries uh, in Southern California earlier this year. The teachers strike, the, the dock workers went on strike, the writers are still striking just feet from where I'm standing uh, right now. So I think this is part of this sort of a labor wave of trying to get these employers to realize uh, what's happening with the soaring cost of living in Southern California. And so they are demanding a few things. Some of it is, of course, benefits, talking about retirement, talking about health care. But I think the main attraction of us is, of course, they want a big bump in wages. Currently, workers make about $20 to $25 on an hourly basis. They want that bumped up by $5 immediately and then an extra $3 in installments as the contract continues. Workers are outspoken. They're out there right now. Uh, there's some talk about other things like staffing to pre-pandemic levels when we're starting to see pre-pandemic profits. Here are mm -hmm. some of the workers on the line. Listen to this. We want to make sure that the workers that make that what it is um, are able to stay healthy and housed. Since the pandemic, they start cutting people. We have been having a lot of workloads on top of us. Sometimes we end up doing the work of two or three people. And, of course, we should say the bargaining organization representing the hotel chains is saying they tried to negotiate, that they brought a pretty good counter offer to the table, but that wasn't heard at all. It's almost like the union, as in their words, didn't show up to negotiations, that they were more interested in striking than finding a viable solution. Tom? You know, I think it must be pretty tough to get by on that wage in Southern Cal, given how everything has exploded, just cost of living has exploded. But this is also not a good time for the industry, the hotel industry, just now getting back on its feet with robust, a robust return of, uh, of uh, volume, right, of, of customers. Yeah, yeah, huge blow. I think it was meant to maximize that, to really let people know that this is happening and to do it right now. Uh, huge blow to the hotel chains that are trying to do their best to welcome guests. Tom? All right, Steve, thanks very much. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you might want to know about tonight. Number one, Robert De Niro's 19-year-old grandson has died, according to his family. In a statement, the actor said, quote, I am deeply distressed by the passing of my beloved grandson. New York City police say Leandro Nero Rodriguez, an actor himself, was found unconscious on Sunday. A cause of death has not yet been announced. Number two, officials for the PGA Tour are going to testify next week before the Senate on that controversial merger with the Saudi-backed Leave Golf Tour. They want to take a look at that agreement made between the PGA and the Saudi's public investment fund and at the future of the PGA Tour and professional golf in the country. Number three, a union representing many Hollywood actors agreed to an extension of their contract. It was going to expire Friday night and the union authorized a strike if a deal was not reached. The new deadline is next Wednesday. A potential strike would likely shut down TV and film productions. Number four, Mas NASCAR took over the city of Chicago this weekend for the first ever Loop 121 and Grand Park 220 races. 38 cars ripped through the city's streets at 140 miles per hour. I swear I could hear them here. It's part of a push by NASCAR to diversify its fan base and attract more city dwellers to the sport. And number five, tonight's Powerball jackpot is top half a billion with the B dollars. Nobody's hit all the numbers since April. Somebody's bound to get rich soon. The drawing is tonight, but if you can't get a ticket, there's a $400 million Mega Millions jackpot that will have to do. It's up for grabs tomorrow. With much of the country under extreme heat conditions, a lot of Americans are cooling off along the nation's coast. But this is the time of year we talk about the threat beneath the surface. So far this year, there have been 16 shark attacks in waters across the United States, most of them just in the last month or two, at least nine in Florida alone. Thankfully, none of those fatal. Over the last decade, there has been an average of 74 so-called unprovoked bites per year globally. NBC's Sam Brock has more for us on this. 
There is no shark season per se, and the odds of being attacked by a shark unprovoked are exceedingly rare. Marine biologists say it's like the same odds as winning a lottery. And yet, here in Florida, we've seen three examples of either shark attacks or encounters in the last week. That includes one girl who's 12 years old, visiting from Philadelphia, was swimming near Cocoa Beach, ducked for a wave, came back up and saw a shark latched onto her leg. She required 50 stitches, but she is okay. Also, Malia Tribble, who was generating money for cystic fibrosis on a paddleboarding expedition from the Bahamas all the way to Florida, about halfway through that 80-mile trek, her husband noticed a hammerhead shark trailing her paddleboard and guided her onto the safety boat. She's fine as well. That was a close call. At that point, I knew. Um, you know, I felt had felt something right around that time, but I really kind of dismissed it. Um, in my situation, ignorance is bliss. I didn't really see the size of the shark. I didn't see how close it was at that time. There was another example of a gentleman fishing in the Everglades who went to wash his hands and was pulled in, he said, by a bull shark, and he survived too. But the reality is we are seeing a number of these incidents occur. What experts say is, first of all, you're in the shark's habitat, right? And generally, all they're doing is just investigating to see, is it you or is it food? A few pieces of advice to keep in mind. One, make sure that you're staying in clear water so the fish can see you and know that it's not food. Try to avoid swimming near piers and also places that people are fishing because that can be seen as bait. And lastly, if you see fish that are jumping or birds that are diving, that could be indicative of the fact that a predator is nearby. But still, an expert from the Smithsonian says the likelihood or the chances that a shark sees you and just passes right by 99.9% .9 in Miami, Sam Brock, NBC News. I got to say, that happened to me last year. Uh, a big six-footer passed really about five feet away from me, just swam right by, scared the heck out of me. He wasn't interested. Sam, thank you. When we come back, romance scams taking a heartbreaking and dangerous turn. Two people shared their stories with NBC News despite the stigma. So we're talking to the reporter behind that story for our backstory tonight. Plus, uneasy calm in Paris following thousands of arrests and violent protests over recent days after police shot and killed a teenager. But the victim's family is seen later in the global. Okay, time now to get to the backstory, which is our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together at NBC and how it fits into our bigger picture. Online romance scams are raking in millions of dollars taken from people who had no idea that they were being taken advantage of until it was too late. And it's pushing some victims so devastated by what they've lost to self-harm. In a new NBC News report, our Kevin Collier talked to two people who know that situation well. Norm Jones, who survived a suicide attempt earlier this year, and Ashley, whose father ended up dying by suicide in January. Jones says his online girlfriend became a major part of his life. They talked every day for months. He would write her songs, and she would push him to invest money through a crypto website. It was only later that Jones realized the $250,000 he'd invested, along with his life savings and retirement, were gone. And there wasn't much that could be done about it. In March, first responders found him unconscious in his bathroom after he attempted suicide. And Ashley, she told Kevin she had no idea her dad was involved in a romance investment scam until he was already gone. She pieced most of it all together by looking through his phone. She saw that over the course of four months, someone her dad considered an online romantic partner convinced him to dump around $500,000 into a fake scheme. And it's not just them. According to the AARP's Fraud Watch Network, referring victims to a suicide hotline has become a, quote, daily occurrence. NBC's Kevin Collier joins me now. Kevin, you know, this is just heartbreaking to hear these stories. Despite the stigma around this, Jones and Ashley decided to share their stories with you. How did you find them? First of all, how did you find them? And then how did you get them to open up about something that was so personal and sensitive? Well, you know, I, I cover stuff like this, and I'm constantly speaking with law enforcement, with, with people who track scams, and uh, I've been hearing whispers for a long time. This isn't just, you know, hurting people's pocketbooks. It's literally killing people. So it took a while of, you know, a lot of people who are prosecutors who work in this space, they're, they're not going to just, like, say, you know, hey, here's the number of somebody uh, who's in this, you know, who's gone through everything like this. But I will give them my name and number and tell them, you know, reach out if they're, if they're willing to share their story. And there's a long process of that. Uh, and we went through 
you know, it, it was months putting this all together. Um, but eventually I was able to convince these two to just speak with me on the record using their real names to share the most awful thing that could possibly happen. What did those conversations look like? They, they were brutal. I mean, you know, I, I cover cybersecurity. That, that's my, my day job. Um, and we, you know, I don't often get into people talking about uh, things this this deep. I'm, I'll tell you this. I, I spoke with Norm for hours, hours and hours, um, but, you know, the person who, who attempted uh, to die. And I'm not really much of a crier. I could not hold back when he was kind of walking me through the, the darkest moments. He, he really thought he had lost everything. He had not. He has friends and family who still love him, even though he's lost, you know, all his financial, uh, almost everything he, he owns materially. Um, but it was, it was really rough and, and, and really dark. You know, I guess the FBI's most recent stats say that the total losses are of more than, there are th total losses of about $3 billion, uh, double what they were in 2021. It, it's happened a lot, right? I mean, regardless, there's still the stigma because we've all been warned, don't fall prey to this. And that's something that you saw even when you were publishing this article? Yeah, I mean, I posted the story on, on social media, and, and you saw people saying, you know, hey, why would a cybersecurity expert fall for this sort of thing? I mean, Norm's not even the first cybersecurity expert that I personally have spoken with who has lost hundreds of thousands of dollars to this scam. It gets people. Uh, it, I think Wait, cybersecurity experts? Cybersecurity yes. experts? Yes. You, you, you know of several who have fallen prey. Yes. Yes. It's... It, it cashes in on on the hype around crypto. You, you'll get the scammers can be incredibly articulate and specific. The, the scam itself is very very convincing. You say, some in some cases they'll let you pull out money. You say, oh, can I can I pull out the five thousand I invested? Or, you know, it made me an additional ten. Can I pull that out? And the scammers will let you do that. And it's only yeah. once the scammer has invested so much, hundreds of thousands of dollars, that they really put the squeeze on, and and you can't withdraw your money anymore. And, and there's always too. there's always this human element, isn't there? There's always this human uh, who is impact impacted in some way by these stories. Uh, but sometimes it's just so much more personal. H how did this story differ from other pieces that you report on? Because this one really does involve people's lives, their feelings, their emotions, their well-being, and then suicide. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Tom, I uh, I cover hackers and, and scammers almost every day. Uh, and we're always looking for what is the real human harm. Somebody might say, you know, a, a school got hacked and your kids' names and, and their personal information was leaked. And that can be profoundly creepy, but you don't always necessarily see an immediate impact to that. You know, they, they, the kids can go on, on with their lives. This was particularly powerful because we're talking about literally people who, who feel like they have nothing left because the scam yeah. is so so impactful, so so powerful. And it's I hope a, people it's a good realize, morning. by the way, that uh, the reason why these people shared these stories with me, with the world, is to help dispel some of that stigma. NBCnews.com is Kevin's reporter, uh, reporting, rather. Kevin, thank you very much. If you or someone you know is in a crisis, call or text this number on your screen, 988, or text the word home to the crisis text line, 741 741. Coming up, a new way to battle wildfires to focus on protecting the people who are fighting those fires. We will explain that after the break. So Wimbledon is officially underway again, and Novak Djokovic going now his, for his fifth straight and eighth overall men's singles championship. He won his first round match today in straight sets after a short rain delay. Djokovic even did a brief stint as a groundskeeper using his towel to help dry the grass off on center court. Meanwhile, 43-year-old Venus Williams with a big scare today, screaming and pain, clutching her knee after she slipped on the grass just three games into her Wimbledon return. But the five-time Wimbledon champ refused to quit. She went on to finish her match, though she lost to Ukrainian Alina Svetolina. Another American seventh-seeded Coco Goff was also knocked out in the first round of the tournament today in an upset loss to Sofia Kennan. Andrew Krasny is joining us now. Uh, Djokovic actually isn't even at the top seed at Wimbledon, right? Despite going for men's record extending 24th Grand Slam title. H how is the men's bracket shaping up right now? Okay, well, I'll tell you, there's one guy at Wimbledon this year who can beat Novak Djokovic. I'll give you one guess who it is, Tom. And it is, are you ready? 
Boris only Becker. Novak Djokovic. <laughs> no, I think it's only Novak Djokovic, to be honest oh. with you. Uh, he's unbeatable. I think there's only one person who can beat him. That's himself. Really? Novak, who's been ranked number one in the world. He's not one right now. He's maybe just a few points shy of uh, regaining that number one ranking. A, a record 389 weeks. He's, uh, he's won an incredible 24 majors or 23 majors going for his 24. He's unstoppable. And I think we're about to see perfection as he continues to break records. Now, he is astonishing. Uh, tell us now who we should be watching for on the women's side. And there may not be a lot of names that I can pronounce, right? But walk us through that. Okay, well, there's Iga Shiantek, who's number one in the world, who's showing everybody at 21, 22 years old that she is virtually unbeatable. But uh, there are some people who can do some damage against her. We're talking, of course, uh, uh, Elena Rabakina, who's the defending champion. She is from Kazakhstan. She's a tough player, plays really well in grass. Anjabur, who made it to two finals and Grand Slams last year, U.S. Open and Wimbledon. She's the most successful era player in WTA history. She's very crafty on grass. She's one of those who can be dangerous against herself. She tends to get a little nervous in the, in the very important matches. So we're keeping an eye on Anja Bohr. Uh, Sophia Kennan. Sophia Kennan just beat Coco Goff today. She's a Grand Slam champion. So on the women's side, it's still very tough. But even on the men's side, you're looking at Carlos Alcaraz, Stefano Tsitsipas, Francis Tiafo. There's a ton of storylines that can develop. Today's only the first day. Only the first day. Andrew, thank you very much. Andrew Krasny, who is covering it all for us. NBC covers hundreds of international stories each day, and because you can't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our foreign desk is doing it for all of us. Here are some of the stories they say we need to keep an eye on. We call the segment The Global. Out of France, tension still high after police shot and killed a teen during a traffic stop last week. Riots have been sparked across the country, leading to thousands of arrests and an attack on a mayor's home. The teen's grandmother called on rioters to stop the violence. Out of Russia today, the U.S. Ambassador Ambassador to Russia visited detained American journalist Evan Jerskovich, uh, the Wall Street Journal reporter who was arrested in March. It's now the second time the Biden administration officials have gone to see him since his arrest, and it comes after a Moscow court said that he has to stay in prison through late August. A State Department spokesperson said he is, quote, in good health and again called for his release. Turning now to a tragic anniversary. It's been 10 years since a group of elite firefighters were killed battling an out of control fire in Prescott, Arizona. 19 hotshot firefighters, a quarter of the local fire department, died on June 30th, 2013. The Yarnell Hill fire remains the deadliest fire in the last 80 years and the largest loss of firefighter lives since September 11th. It was a devastating tragedy with long lasting impacts on that community. It was also a turning point in how fire crews everywhere battle large, uncontrollable blazes. Our Lindsay Reiser was a reporter in Phoenix at the time. She has this story. Ten years ago, Prescott, Arizona, a small city 90 minutes north of Phoenix, became known for what it lost. 19 highly trained Granite Mountain hotshots died while fighting the Yarnell Hill fire just south of Prescott. You remember every detail of what you wore that day to what you were doing the second you found out. Alicia Moffat was engaged to 22-year-old Wade Parker, who was in his rookie season with the elite wildland fighter fighting group. They were called to fight an explosive fire threatening homes in nearby Yarnell, spitting out flames as high as 20 feet. The crew lost communication and left their safe zone. When the fast-moving fire changed directions, trapping the hot shots, they were forced to deploy their emergency shelters. All but the lone lookout perished. I went from planning our wedding that was going to be two months from then to literally planning his funeral and trying to attend 18 other funerals on top of that. It is still the deadliest U.S. wildfire in 80 years and the largest loss of firefighters' lives since September 11th. We recognize when you lose a quarter of your department, what that means to you on a human level is completely different. Prescott Fire Chief Holger Durr says due in part to this disaster, their approach to how they fight fire has changed. We don't deploy a bunch of firefighters to the tip of a hurricane. When the hurricane comes, we wait for the hurricane to come through, and then, you know, we rescue people after that. 
And with fires burning hotter, faster, and becoming more unpredictable thanks to climate change, according to fire forecasters, it's a strategy focused on protecting lives and learning to live with the dangers of wildfires. If we can't succeed, we're going to step back and find a, a better approach, a better strategy. And our highest priority is um, life safety, firefighter and public safety. Technology has advanced. Communication and fire tracking have also improved, fire personnel tell us. And now departments like Prescott are using drones. In dangerous situations, they can scout trouble spots from above, replacing the need for boots on the ground reshaping how communities fight forest fires as they honor and grieve the men who gave their lives, protecting one they loved. I just hope they remember who these guys outside of their job were husbands and brothers and sons and this crew that went there together and they died together and they all stayed together. Lindsay Reiser, NBC News. That is a wrap for this hour and for the one before it. And if you missed any of it, you can catch up on the latest reporting, newest interviews from our team. You can find us anytime in so many places. Peacock, Roku, Pluto, TV, Hulu, you name it. News Now on NBC News is just now wrapping up for the Hallie Jackson Report. Top story picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.